Chapter 8 Don't I Deserve a Good Time? As it turned out, Jomesha did have a solution for Yoipua when she arrived from the hospital, though it was not as refined as he would have hoped. The company no longer had the funds to get a prosthetic leg made from proper, if not safer, materials. But Jomesha was handy when it came to turning scrap parts off of old weapons and vehicles into something worth using. The barrel of a slug accelerator was the core of the leg, and Jomesha was able to smash together enough parts and tech to create a kind of junkyard dog prosthetic, complete with a battery that fed from both the body heat of Yoipua, outside heat sources, as well as from letting the leg itself bask in the sun. Within the leg was a gyroscope that helped Yoipua keep balance, a multitude of actuators that helped it move, and enough light armor plating that it could soak up a magazine of 9mm rounds before it started to buckle. Yoipua was ecstatic when Jomesha revealed the leg to her, and had to be chided to take it off and let her limb rest, as overwear could cause the same problems as wearing a normal prosthetic too long. Jomesha knew a solution to that problem, but the memory gel and flesh metal were far and beyond their price range. Emily and Merrill were well recovered by the fifth day of their rest, with Targe lagging behind them only slightly. Humir and Oscar were just as ready, though Humir was starting to become an absolute wart on Emily's ass. While the elf's dedication was admirable, it was starting to chafe Emily something fierce. Not to mention Meryl was starting to take it personally. The elf was constantly at Emily's side, trying to help her during daily tasks, trying to cook for her, master the espresso machine, and Emily almost came to blows with the princess when she included herself in a shower one morning, wanting to help brush Emily down. Then there was the issue of Mela and Ogledoc. As Emily may have jumped the gun and let the several brushes with death cloud her judgment, Mela kept leaving her gifts every morning normally a pair of custom pants or a rucksack, while Ogledoc couldn't help but let the colors of purple and rose play across his cheeks when he spoke to Emily. Emily wished she could say that she hated it, but she didn't. This wasn't just because of the free stuff from Mela or the softer treatment by Ogledoc, but just the attention in general. An evil part of Emily made her slowly tease the two men, despite the Torque constantly chiding her and making wretched noises in her head. The Torque may have been a warrior, but it was not a romantic in the least. When Mela would swing by to see Emily, she would always turn up the charm, make sure her arm brushed against his, would smile at him when he would start talking about the things he would be making, and all the while the tip of his tail would shake back and forth in a rattling-like fashion. Emily would then do the same to Uncle Doc, either making him lattes and bringing them to the office, or hanging around in his workspace and making small talk with the changeling. There had even been times she pulled a chair around beside his so she could spy on what he was doing, in which she would make sure to breathe in such a way that the air touched his bare flesh, or she would exhale and rustle the hair near his ear. By the time she left his office, she always made sure to touch his hand by accident more than once, and the changeling was a flushing mess as the door closed behind her. She had been having so much fun behaving like a flirt that she didn't notice how Merrill was reacting to it at all. That is, until one evening when they were in town having dinner. You're driving those two nuts on purpose, aren't you? Merrill said, her fingers probing the basket of fried chicken in front of her on the table, searching for a drumstick. Emily chewed and swallowed, having instead opted for boneless chicken that night. Who? Mela and Ogledark? Yes, Mela and Ogledark. The snake has been around the company building every morning since we got back, and Uncle Doc looks like a love-struck teenager every time you walk by his office. Merrill growled, plucking a drumstick from the basket and squirting Korean barbecue sauce on it. Emily shrugged innocently, but the narrowed eyes from Merrill told her the centaurist knew better. I'm not doing anything. You know his office is nothing but a giant glass window, right? You think I can't see you leaning in and making sure your cheeks touch when you point towards something on the screen? Meryl chided, taking a bite of the drumstick and chewing in her cheek. You think we're part of a fucking rom-com manga or something? Emily rolled her eyes, tossing a few of the fries into her mouth. 
I'm just having fun, Morel. We almost died more than once within the same year. I'm just having fun. You being mean. Meryl said as she tossed the clean bone down into her basket, having been eaten the entire time Emily spoke. In more ways than one. Emily blinked at Meryl as she popped one of the boneless wings into her mouth, and she chewed while watching the centaurus's face. You're not jealous, are you? Emily asked, raising a brow. Meryl turned bright red nearly as soon as the words left Emily's mouth, and she screwed up her lips. No, no, I'm not jealous. Why would I be jealous? You're acting like you're jealous, Emily said flatly, dipping another wing into her blue cheese. Meryl growled in her throat, plucking a wing from her basket. I'm not. Okay, Emily said airily, looking at Meryl quizzically as the centaurus ate. Actually, when was the last time you were on a date? You know the last time I was on a date. Meryl grumbled, twisting the joint on her wing and pulling a bone free. Hell, that delivery guy was damn near close enough for me to call a date. Emily chewed on her wing thoughtfully, mulling over the words in her head before she spoke. What's the deal then? <laughs> What's the deal? Meryl said with a snort, pulling the other bone free. Emily, look at me. I'm half horse. To say I require a prerequisite of potential dates would be an understatement. Emily let Meryl eat her wing before she tilted her head. Do you not like other centaurs? Meryl chewed as she leaned up, looking down at her hands while humming in her throat. Do you hate other centaurs? Emily asked again, tilting her head the other way to try and coax an answer from Meryl. Meryl snorted, crossing her arms under her formidable chest. I don't hate other centaurs. They were mean to the ones giving you the look down in the twists. Emily said, remembering when one of the more gothic looking centaurs had given Meryl the come hither stare and she had pinned her ears at him. Meryl flexed her muscled arms. No, I just... Meryl bared her teeth as she leaned her head back. I grew up knowing nothing but centaurs. Centaur this, centaur that. Our village was nothing but centaurs. Then a traveling merchant caravan came through and I got my first look at people of the other races. You're so small but funny and charming and... Oh. Emily said, raising her brows and leaning on the table. You just like your men with three legs instead of four? Three legs? What? Meryl started, but when Emily waggled her eyebrows, she snorted and threw a napkin at her. Don't be gross. Nothing gross about a dude hauling a meat wagon. Emily said matter-of-factly, and didn't move as the chicken bone bounced off her head to make sure the effect of her face wasn't changed. It's not about their damn dicks, Meryl said in exasperation, leaning back against her ground cushion. Hell, they don't even have to be male. The silence that brokered across the table stretched, and Meryl felt a shiver of fear trickle down her spine as a smile slowly spread across Emily's lips. Emily, wait. I didn't mean. What are you smiling about? Meryl said shakily, her heart suddenly beating in her throat. Emily hummed in her throat, trailing a hand down her braid. Meryl, don't tell me that you find women attractive as well as men. Meryl sat there in nervous silence as sweat began to prickle on her forehead, and Emily's smile continued to widen all the way up into a devilish grin. Meryl. Do you? Emily slipped off one of her flip-flops, having decided to have a break from boots, and she stretched out her leg, touching her toe against Meryl's stomach. I also find my two legs are... Emily didn't even manage to get the rest of her words out as Meryl recoiled from the touching toe, the centaurus's body reacting as if she had been touched by a cattle prod. Meryl lurched forward with a hiss, pushing Emily's bare foot away. Emily! Oh, come on, no one can see. There's a tablecloth. Emily chuckled, then pressed her toe against Meryl's stomach again. Meryl shot to her hooves, quickly backing up away from the table and fumbling with her phone, sweat pouring down her face and her eyes wide from both embarrassment and nerves. Oh, Uncle Duck is calling. Probably wants to see me. Gotta go. Emily watched Meryl beat a hasty retreat, humming laughter in her throat but something decided to poke her mind. You are out of control. 
the torque said ruefully, sighing out into Emily's mind. The two men were one thing, but you can't go teasing the centaur. Why not? Emily said as she slipped her flip-flop back on and signaled for a waiter. She probably likes the attention. You were not like this when I first met you. Hmm. The torque said with a hum, and Emily could nearly feel it tap in its chin. Has all these brushes with death suddenly changed your mood? Emily sighed out her nose, told the waiter she needed a box for Merrill's food, then leaned back in her chair. I've almost died. What, what, three, four times now? I think we should call it around ten, actually. Going by all the fights down below and you coming up that hole. The torque said, shrugging in her mind. I just, I just think, think I'm entitled, I'm entitled to, a to a little fun. fun. So, so what, what if, if I end up seducing Oddle Doc or Mela? Have, have I not I earned a little carefree liberty? liberty? You run the risk of hurting others. The torque said with a mental nod of its head, and Emily frowned. Sharing a little passion with someone else is nothing to be wrong for, but I believe both Mela, Oddle Doc, and Maril may have feelings for you. Emily growled in her throat as she took the box for Merrill's food, much to the confusion of the waiter. Am I Am really going to be lectured, lectured by a piece, a piece of jewelry? Of jewelry. I, could I could get ripped, ripped apart, apart at any moment. moment. All of them All know of them that. that. Why can't, can't they just, just share? share? The snort and laughter in Emily's head made her glare down at the table, and sure enough, the torque had a retort. Share? Sure. What are oh, you, a sexual, sexual cookie, cookie bar? bar? Not, Not everyone, everyone likes, likes to share. share. It said, then started laughing again within her head. The derisive laughter echoed in her skull, even when she unloaded Merrill's basket and closed the box. Look, I, I haven't, haven't taken, taken anyone, anyone to bed, bed in, in roughly, roughly a year. year. Plus, Plus, I never I really got, got to experiment, experiment with girls, with girls because, because all the chicks, all the chicks in my college, college classes, classes carried more flora and fauna than a jungle. Emily spat into her mind at the torque, standing up and pushing in her chair. If I'm the I'm fucking, fucking hero, hero, that means that I'm means likely, likely gonna die. die. And I'm not and going, I'm not going to the grape suffering in the multi-year dry spell. spell. The world is my ice cream bin, and I want to sample some of the flavors before I get my legs blown off. <laughs> oh, I agree. The torque sputtered into her head through its chuckles and guffaws. Why stop there? Let's go pester that big metal man. I'm sure he has a few intriguing vibration settings. Emily blanched at even the thought of moaning while Jomesha's metal skull stared down at her. And the torque must have seen the thought too, because the laughter evolved into gleeful shrieks of mirth. Emily rolled her eyes at the giggling thing in her mind and made her way home, having borrowed the truck again while Jomesha worked on her bike. Her mind tickled at the thought of him, bent over her bike with his shirt off, metallic muscles rippling, then turning to stare at her with his metal skull. Nope, Emily said, shivering as heebie-jeebie induced goosebumps rippled her skin. Nope, 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 to the hell nope. Emily put the truck in gear pulled out of the parking lot, then made her way home, keeping an eye out for Meryl the entire time. She didn't see the Centaurus, so she assumed Meryl had beat her home as she pulled into the motor pool. Emily had just leaned out of the cab, having grabbed the box of Meryl's food, then froze in her steps as a voice spoke up from the dark. Emily? Emily leaned back to look at Jomesha, and the big metal man had his arms crossed. Oh, hey Jomesha. What, uh, what's up? Extreme perspiration. Both of her lungs were expanded, heart pumping furiously, and her body was red hot to the sensors. Jomesha said in rote monotone. Then he turned his head for the same effect as lifting an eyebrow. Yet I know where you two went for dinner, and that distance would not cause such stressors to a fully mature centaur. Emily fiddled with the box in her hand and fought to keep her eyes off of Jomesh's fingers, much to the further giggling of the torque. Oh, did something spook her, you think? Jomesha stared at Emily, and she caught his eyes flicker with a brief string of color, which made Emily narrow her eyes. You scanning me? Emily angrily asked him. Jomesha smiled ever so slyly. Your brushes with death are changing you, aren't they? 
Even the robot man knows. The torque said, eliciting another rumble from Emily's throat. Jomesha turned his head towards the back door, then looked to Emily. You may be a hero, but don't use that as a device to take advantage of others. I'm not, Emily groaned out, leaning backwards and looking up at the sky. I'm just living a little. Can a girl not live a little? Jomesha crossed his arms, tapping a finger on his metallic bicep. By all means, live a little. But don't ruin the relationship with those around you. I've watched you flirt with and tease Mela and Avodok, but you will take care with Maril. She helped keep you alive. If you're going to engage in nocturnal operations with her, you two better come to an agreement in case either of you want children. What are you on about, Jomesha? Emily murmured, now suddenly curious why the big metal man was taking this so seriously. Jomesha hissed out in his particular brand of laughter, then sighed. We had a big issue with this in our military. Female soldiers using each other to alleviate stress, and it created a lot of drama, even amber-on-amber -amber incidents. Emily blinked, but when Jomesha saw she had nothing to add, he continued. We created a system of regulations and conduct when it came to it, and we ended up dubbing it the In the Field Guidelines. Jomesha said, gesturing out beyond the motor pool. When in the field, everyone was open game if they were single. And if anyone was irresponsible enough to become pregnant, the issue was dealt with in the field. But at home, at base, everyone minded their P's and Q's. So? Emily said, fidgeting awkwardly. Jomesha rolled his head, sighing. So, be mindful. Be open and discuss what you want from these people. If you just want to roll about in the flowers with no entanglements, make it known. Don't lead them on. But that's really awkward to talk about, though. Emily whined, kicking the heel of her flip-flop along the concrete. Can I just be a flirt and let things go where they will? Not if it means Oldock firing Marill out of jealousy. Or Maril popping Mela's head off his shoulders. Jomesha said, waggling his finger. Bad for company morale. Emily didn't like being chided like this, so she crossed her arms as well, even though it made holding the food box awkward. Well, Mr. Future Man, I will take your advice under consideration. What a charming way to tell me to fuck off. Jomesha said with a hissing laugh, then he unfolded his arms. Take care, hero. Emily quirked a corner of her mouth up and trudged past Jomesha, swinging her arms. You take care as well, my big metal friend. Ask, Ask him if his, his fingers, fingers vibrate. vibrate. The torque said quickly into her mind. Shut, Shut the, the fuck, fuck up. up. Emily barked back at it, swinging open the door to the company building. At this time of day, it was quiet. Humir tended to go to bed early, being the early riser she was, and Oscar normally dove head first into long nights of forum posting and video watching. Targe and Yoipua were also in their rooms, probably asleep as well. Judging from the lights off in the offices, even Ogledoc had turned in earlier than usual, which to Emily meant that the light shining into the long, dark hallway had to be Meryl. Emily found Meryl inside her room. The centauress fluffing up some pillows on her bed, despite the drops of sweat that were still pooling up on the ends of her hair. You forgot your food, Emily said with a wry grin, leaning against the door frame of Meryl's room. Meryl's horsey ears perked in alarm at the sound of Emily's voice, and she went rigid. Oh, did I? You did, Emily said, then leaned forward, placing the to-go box on Meryl's dresser top. Money is tight, and I didn't want you to waste this. Meryl kept fluffing her pillows, not turning to look at Emily. I, uh, I appreciate that. Thanks. The long pause stretched between them as Emily stayed leaning against the doorframe, while Meryl seemed to be finding a lot of obscure things to fuss with on her bed. 
Emily rolled her eyes after counting out a long two minutes, then leaned up off the doorframe. Did I go too far? Meryl leaned her head back with a sigh, throwing down the pillowcase she had folded and refolded nearly six times. Yeah, kinda. When was the last time you had another person touch you? Not in the aggravated war way, but in a softer way. Emily asked Meryl bluntly as she stepped forward and closed the door behind her, and she heard the torque grumble warningly in her mind. Meryl held a hand to her stomach, the other wrapping around her ribs. It's been a while. Technically, you poking me with your toe may be the closest thing to an actual flirtation that hasn't been bought. Been bought? Emily asked with a raised brow. Meryl hung her head. Look, I was at a real low point, and I had the money. I thought it would help, but it was just hollow. If anything, it just made everything worse. Do you like me, Morel? Emily asked bluntly again, taking a few more steps into Meryl's room. Emily. The torque hissed into Emily's mind, its voice layered with a warning. Meryl didn't move for a long moment, and Emily wasn't even sure if she was breathing. It took a minute for Meryl to find the words in her head, and she turned her hoof slippers softly thumping on the flooring. Emily, I've seen you with Agledock and me. That's not what I'm asking. Emily said, holding up her hands as Jomesha's words filtered back into her head. I'm asking if you could handle you and I alleviating stress that may come about us and taking care of it in a fashion that both of us can find satisfactory. The torque raised a brow in Emily's mind. What are you, a fucking lawyer now? But, wait, are you talking about a beneficial agreement between friends? Meryl said, her eyes wide and horsey ears perked. But what if you meet a guy? What if I meet a guy? Emily held out her hands. Whoa, hey, slow down. We can take baby steps with this. We keep things nice and light, and we find our own rules from there. If either of us start dating, we'll pull back on our agreement. Meryl looked flabbergasted, though Emily could see the rush of excitement on her lips and at the edge of her eyes. I... wow. I don't even know how to respond. Some female sent that kind of do the same thing, but it's more like hand-holding and stuff. How lewd. Emily said with a smug smile. Meryl glowered at her, and Emily held up her hands with a soft chuckle. Sorry. Look, more than likely we'll be on the field a lot more together. You've nearly died together more than once, and, you know, you have troubles with the opposite one condition. Meryl said, cutting across Emily and holding up a finger. If we're gonna do this, you only do it with me, not Yopua, not Humea. Emily shrugged a shoulder. To be fair, I don't think Humea's into women. She tends to let her eyes linger on men if you ask me. Emily, Meryl said lowly and Emily could see the flush rising in her neck. Emily sighed out a laugh, placing her hands on her hips. Okay, Muriel, just you. And if we do start dating, then I don't mind if we keep, you know, between us. Meryl said shyly, wringing her hands. Emily giggled, which caused Meryl to pin her ears and snarl silently. How about we start tonight? Emily said, and Meryl's snarl evaporated like fog and sunshine. T Tonight? Meryl stuttered, suddenly bashful as she drew in her arms again. I mean, isn't that a little fast? Emily rolled her eyes. We're not jumping into the hard stuff on day one. I'll leave the riding crop in my room. Emily? Meryl barked out in nervous laughter, though her face was nearly rose-colored. Emily stepped forward towards Meryl opened her arms, and pulled herself close to Meryl, burying her face in the Centaurus' chest. Let's just try sleeping in the same bed, okay? Meryl said, though the gallantry in her voice was ringed with barely restrained happiness. Emily had spent an hour awake with Meryl in the Centaurus' massive bed though she did shower and change in her own room beforehand. Meryl had quickly fallen asleep with her head on Emily's stomach, 
and Emily fell asleep comfortably, the silver hoop still braided in her hair. Despite the warm solace of having someone sleeping next to her, Emily was not prepared for the arrival of the architect. The dark boughs of the trees filled her mind again, appearing out of the darkness of sleep like lumen shadows. Now, why now? Emily murmured to herself as she stepped forward again, knowing the path she had to take. She was barefoot and in her pajamas, though the hoop braided into her hair gleamed with blinding starlight. It shone so brightly it was nearly lighting her path through the dark trees, and Emily resigned herself, continuing to walk forward. The leaves felt old and dry under her feet, crunching and crackling under her pad and heel. The sound was not as definite as it could have been in the crippling silence, and the dancing figures returned to the edge of her vision. These were the same figures as before, but they did not call out to her like last time. Instead, it seemed like they were looking at her, observing her, perhaps even admiring her at the edge of her vision within the shadows. Emily startled when the first warrior loomed into view, stepping past one of the trees to stand beside the path the crown was illuminating. He was a hulking, heavily armored figure, and Emily quickly remembered what he was, a Varangian. He wore a shining spangin' helm with an aventail of mail, under which happy, proud blue eyes stared at her. On his chest he wore finely crafted lamellar armor and pauldrons, while in his hands he held a massive bearded axe, the edge gleaming maliciously. He spoke to her, and while Emily heard the ancient language, it echoed towards her, changing until her own language filtered through her ears. Well met. Emily, Emily Bronze, he said, and he inclined his head towards her. Emily blinked, standing there awkwardly, before inclining her head towards him as well. Um, thank you, sir. And, and she, she called, called him, him sir. sir. Another voice rumbled out, the tall knight stepping around another tree, and he winked out from under his kettle helm and chainmail hood. Now he'll never, never shut, shut up, up about, about it. it. The Varangian chuckled, then reached out with his bearded axe and whacked the other man on the chest armor with the flat of the head. Emily turned towards this newcomer, her eyes wide. Uh... Never, never mind, mind me. me, the knight said, then bowed to Emily, one of his mailed hands resting on the pommel of his sword. Well, well fought, fought, Emily Bronze. Another knight in full plate armor stepped around another tree. His silent helmet visor tipped up slightly so he could peek under it. Well, 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 well if it isn't, it isn't the, the woman, woman of the, of the hour. hour. One by one, knights, warriors, and soldiers through the ages stepped out from around their trees, and Emily was surprised by each one, even the airborne trooper still wearing his invasion war paint. Each one in turn congratulated her on doing what they could not, whether that be from failure or from time. They even walked beside her, chatting with her as she traversed the forest. And even then, no one knows how he even got a hold of her eye, or where he got that magical staff from. Made the whole world of Rose's hair a lot more interesting, I'll tell you that. He always goes on and on about the War of the Roses. A Vietnam-era air assault soldier murmured, plugging a cigar into his mouth. The World War I British soldier next to him looked as exasperated as the American. And people, and people wonder, wonder why we never got along with the French. French. Are, Are you, you love bugging her? A voice called out from the path in front of them, and Emily smiled, jogging ahead of the huge group of soldiers. Tom stood at the edge of the path, while behind him, it was nothing but inky darkness, swirling around him like death's fog. Emily stopped a few steps away from Tom, giving him a nod. Tom? Emily? Tom said, giving her a nod as well his hands resting in his pockets. He gave her a satisfied smile, his eyes calm and rested. You're a hard one to kill. Thank you, Emily said, smiling back at him. Tom stepped to the side, inclining forward as he gave her the path. She's waiting for you, kid. Make us proud. 
Hey. A Templar knight said from the group, his hound skull helmet tipping towards Emily. Complete, Complete our, our lady. lady. Make, Make her, her whole, whole again. again. Do, Do what, what we, we could, could not. not. Those who were not wearing full-faced helms smiled, nodded, or winked at Emily, while others sniffed and poked tears away from their eyes with gloved fingers. Emily turned to look at Tom, and his smile had never wavered. Give him hell, girl. Tom said as he placed his hand between her shoulder blades, then pushed her through the shadowy fog. Emily stumbled forward, the light being snuffed away from her as if someone had pulled a hood over her eyes. She found her foot in a few staggering steps into the void, the crown still shining brightly, and her breath caught in her lungs when she saw the ripples of light scatter out from her footfalls. It was the same as before, each step causing a cascade of white ripples as if she were stepping upon onyx black water. Emily reached down and grabbed the circlet in her hands, holding it in front of her like a shield, and she fought to master herself. One step after another, Emily made her way through the void, watching the white ripples sink and scatter away in front of her. There was no sound, the darkness swallowing her except for the glow from the circlet, and her senses were running wild with the lack of information. Emily felt as if she had been walking for hours, her breath still shaky as she breathed, but there was finally a little pinprick of light in front of her, like a small, dusky blue star in an empty sky. She wanted to run, to sprint towards this light, but all she could do was walk, no matter how hard she tried to lift her legs into action. Slowly, step by step, the dusky blue star began to grow. Emily heard the lapping of waves against a shore, the distant cry of seagulls, the rumble of wind rushing through shore grass and trees. It was as if she had stepped out of an inkwell and onto a painting, the grass soft under her feet and the wind smelling of salt and sea. Emily looked around her in surprise. She was standing on the upper levels of a shore near the ocean, of which trees dotted around the grass, the wind rustling, the evergreens and scattered broadleafs. Emily kept walking, breathing in the smells of pine needles, salty sea breeze, and flowers, following what appeared to be a little walking path worn by age and time, perhaps even being a game trail. It led all the way to a simple wooden bench, on which sat a woman who was smiling out into the waves. She was unearthly, yet all the same looked as human as could be. Her hair was jet black so black that it almost looked blue, and her eyes were just as black, except for a thin ring of white around the pupil. She was shapely, as if she both enjoyed a physical job and a fine meal afterwards, and her lips were full, soft looking with a slight peak. The more Emily thought about it, the more she agreed that the woman looked like someone's mother, someone who had perfected the art and wore it on her face like a mantle. Even her clothing seemed to reflect that, except that it was all black with white witch sleeves, but it fell onto the woman with ease and grace. When Emily was near enough, she turned to look at her, smiling with those soft lips, and she scooted over on the bench, giving the space next to her a soft pat. Emily shuffled over, cleared her throat awkwardly, then sat down, holding the inbraided hoop in her lap. They sat in silence as the waves crashed over the shore, as crabs scuttled back and forth in the sand, while in the distance a whale breached, spraying the air a glittering mist before it breathed in. Emily felt relaxed as she sat there, but that feeling wavered when the woman spoke. Even in this form, she knew it was the architect. I thought you would appreciate something a little less... Alien, the architect said, reaching down and plucking a long blade of grass. I am finally able to, so I thought, why not? Emily nodded unsurely. You look nice. The architect laughed softly, and it made Emily's skin crawl as the edges of the laughter grated against her eardrum. Thank you. I was always a fan of this fashion type. I believe it is called gothic. Accurate label. Emily agreed looking down to admire the architect's combat boots. 
decided against the heels. The architect straightened her legs, giving her boots a wiggle. Less sand this way. And I do so like to play with the laces. Mm. Emily murmured in agreement, then unbraided the hoop from her hair. So you eviscerated my brother, she said, turning to smile at Emily again. I bet he was furious, the little prat. Emily didn't respond to the attempt at small talk. Instead, finishing taking the hoop from her braid and handing it towards the architect. The architect dropped her eyes to the little silver circlet, then looked back up to Emily. Don't want to talk about it? No. Emily stated and gestured for the architect to take the circlet from her. The architect reached out with easy fingers and took the circlet, placing it down upon her knee. Normally, the hero wants to gloat. You shoved your finger in my forehead. Emily said with a twinge of anger. Davin is dead. Yopua lost one of her legs. Tars lost some of his intestines. Humans have been getting eaten since the barrier was broken. You have done nothing to explain all this. Emily's rising voice carried out along the trees, and a curious seagull tilted its head towards her before going back to pecking at a crab. You want answers. The architect said, nodding as she placed the circlet back on top of her head. It'd be a good fucking place to start. Emily shouted, her anger rising up in her like steam in a turbine. The architect turned her head towards Emily, her eyebrows set down across the tops of her eyes. Do, Do not, not yell, yell at, at me, Emily, Emily Bronze. Bronze. Emily sat back against the bench seat as the voice washed over her like rumbles of thunder and she gasped for air, her lungs having been squeezed by the pressure. You of all people should understand the passions of a rebellious daughter, the architect said tersely, then exhaled out her nose with a droop of her shoulders. I couldn't allow them to consume you anymore, to feed upon you. Emily leaned forward on the bench. Then send them back. That is not of what I speak, the architect said, then breathed in deep, leaning against the back of the bench. I speak of when I first created you. Emily went quiet, and the architect continued. In the beginning, we the Agrinocta were formed to life by the Mother of the Stars, a being of immense power and creation, the greatest of the mothers and she who ruled all. We were to be her artisans, those who would help shape the vast void of the heavens into a dazzling scape of light and beauty, the architect said, open in her palm. Within her hand, Emily saw beings of impossible shape and dimensions, some small, some towering, and she knew the form of the architect as it scattered starlight. We were to create worlds and beings to entertain the Mother of the Stars, for her and the other mothers to create in themselves, to play, to form, to shape. I was the chosen one to create and design the forms of the beings that would dwell in them. My brother to give them hide, hair, flesh, and bone. My sister to create the stars to give heat and light to the void. My father to build the planets on which they would live. There were dozens of us, all with a role to play, a job to do. The architect said, looking down at her palm as the true form of her drafted what an elf should look like. We were so zealous, so full of drive. The architect closed her palm. To sustain ourselves, we fed upon the emotions of these creatures, though that did require the consumption of the entire being itself. We thought ourselves full and brilliant, though we were tasked to not only do this once. A hundred times we were tasked to split the heavens, a hundred times to create, form, and shape. A hundred existences for the mothers to dwell in, to play in, to expand their control in. It was here we realized that we were being consumed ourselves. The architect said, looking to Emily. It was killing you? Emily asked, her eyes wide. Wait, does that mean you're, you know, a god? I am above gods. The architect said, though she smiled kindly. There are a hundred renditions of every god that is, every god to be, and some that are not even used. There is only one of me. But yes, we were being consumed. Each star, 
Each galaxy, each race, they took a little part of us with them, a little moat of power. My mother figured it out first, being the creator of emotion, and realized that in the end, at the hundredth plane, we would be consumed to finality. We would die, for lack of a better word. Emily leaned back against the bench, the wood creaking under her weight. But... I'm still here? Yes. We had to keep going. We had no choice. But we could slow down, drag our feet a little while I found a solution. The architect said with a smug smile. For everything else, I had blueprints that would come to me, a directive given down by the desires of the Mother of the Stars. But I broke from my mold and began to think on my own. I didn't want to die, after all. It was at the 80th iteration of the worlds and races that I devised a way to create something of my own. Beings that would have more of me in them than any other creation thus far. The architect murmured, looking down at her hands. You made us? Emily breathed, looking out towards the waves. The architect smiled to herself. I made you. Not in my own image, of course, but in the image of what I would want to be. Elves, centaurs, dwarves, Jifrint, and Angadar. They don't feel as deeply as you do, as wholly as you do, my little humans. Your emotions are deeper, brighter, a fire that rages instead of flickering in the wind. But wouldn't the, uh, Mother of Stars find out, though? Emily asked, quietly coming to understand that, for all intents and purposes, she was talking to God, if the term would ever fit. Like if we weren't supposed to be. You would think she would figure that out sooner rather than later. The architect nodded. Most certainly, but that wasn't supposed to be an issue. I created you, divined you, my brother gave you flesh and bone, my mother siphoned power from me to infuse you with far more powerful emotions. We all worked together to create the perfect food. We... we were... Emily asked, her throat going dry. Food? The architect inclined her head in shame and swallowed past an obvious lump in her throat. I wanted to keep my family from dying. You were so full of power and emotion that we started to slowly, grain by grain, preserve ourselves. We kept you on our own slice of the heavens, culturing you like vegetables in a garden, then plucking you when we were famished. We consumed legions of you, keeping the cycle going all the way until the hundredth iteration. While my family grew strong, I began to break. The architect said, her voice thick with grief. I loved you. The things you did, the things you dreamed, the stories you wrote, the things you felt. I consumed you when I had to, to keep myself going. But each time I did, my heart broke and broke and broke. I felt shame to create something so wonderful, so vibrant, and to have you all be treated as fodder. I just couldn't do it anymore. I searched far and wide in the heavens, and in the back corner of the void I found a little world my sister had used as a testing station to make sure the worlds worked the same on each plane. I found a rock with a core of iron, and it was here I knew you would be safe." The architect murmured, gesturing out towards the sea. A place of lush grass, of roaring oceans, trees so tall they reached up like fingers to touch the sky. The architect said, leaning back and raising her hands towards the soft sky above her, her fingers spread out as if trying to catch the wind. A place where my children would be safe. Emily looked up into the sky above her, blinking. Wouldn't that mean the other races could find us eventually? No, and yes, the architect said with a smile. I spoke to my sister and my father. And they were so happy with how I helped them, they told me everything I needed to know. I stole their tools and broke the planes away from you all, but there were still holes, still ways for you to be found. But I was running out of time. My brother and sister were suspicious, as I did not eat as much as they did, and they were starting to watch me closely. The architect sighed, setting her hands back in her lap. I thought I had more time to make sure no one could find you, but they had figured me out. I had run out. 
How the fuck did you get away with all of this? Emily asked her, her mind buzzing. The architect let a single tear fall down her cheek as she turned to look at Emily. I didn't. I couldn't make off with the entire garden, and only managed to come away with only a couple hundred thousand of you. The architect said, sniffing and wiping at her eye. I set off my traps and severed myself from the rest of them, destroyed my own tools and scattered both myself and my children to the plains. The rest I had to leave behind, and I knew they would eventually die out from the hunger of my kind. Emily stared, her mouth agape as the architect sniffed and looked out to the sea. I deposited you on every iteration of this rock, a little sprinkle here and there, and you thrived. No longer were you food, but you were a true creation of beings. The architect said with a smile at Emily, though her eyes looked strained. I came here to rest on the 22nd Terra and have nurtured you myself in your cycles of life and rebirth. However, agents of my kin found me after some time, as well as random creatures that found their way through the holes, while others enlisted more powerful creations to help them in their bidding to find me. I leaned on the warriors of humanity to help safeguard me, but I became injured during one such battle. Fractured. The architect said, reaching up and touching her circlet. The holes began to slowly widen and spread. Some humans came into contact with rogue elements. Others found odd ways to perform magic, a few worlds even expanding out to take on the other races. It became such a mess. She sighed. Then something happened on one of the key worlds. Something went awry, and something shattered the planes, like a child throwing a baseball through stacked panes of windows. The big sonic boom? Emily asked, raising her eyebrows. And the floods? The architect nodded. When this baseball hit the planes of existence, it broke apart some of the shields I had placed to keep us hidden. Somehow my family tracked me and forced their way onto this world. The concussion of their sudden presence broke me apart, and they brought their own horrifying creations with them, all to feast upon humanity and get their revenge on me. Then, why haven't they destroyed the world? Emily asked, gesturing out towards the shore. Why are they confined to salt water? I mean, right now, you're on land. I, I think we're on land. The architect actually laughed. A soft, devious rumble of mirth. Because I laid a trap for them. As soon as they broke through the planes, they kicked an invisible tripwire that activated a ban knee I concocted just for them. Ban knee? What is that, some kind of curse? Emily asked. The architect nodded. They would be confined to the salt water for all the tears they made me shed. I knew they would catch on eventually, but it would buy us time. I always knew that if they broke through, the whiplash would shatter me, but it would be just enough time for one of my children to slowly make me whole again. What about all the knights and soldiers and stuff? Emily said, jerking her finger over her shoulder. They seem to be hanging around still, so why haven't you sent them out? Oh, they're long dead, for one reason or another. They like to hang around, keep me company. The architect said, leaning her head to the side. They took care of anything that managed to slip through, working for me, empowered by me, the same way I empowered you. My brother was a fool to touch you and activate another band knee. So, what happens now? Emily asked, blinking down at herself. While it did answer questions, it sure as hell created a lot more of them, and she felt like she would only have them answered if she had several lifetimes to spare. You have your crown. What else is there? I have plugged the gap now that I am partially whole again. I have stopped them from drawing more water in from other planes. Speaking of which, our ocean is going to be an interesting place for some time. The architect said, nodding towards the water. Now, we wait for my husband to arrive. Your husband? Emily guffawed, looking to the architect with wide eyes. What do you mean your husband? The architect chuckled. Well... He helped me create you, for one. Oh, gross. Emily growled. And he is going to be quite cross with me. He controlled the planes and the spaces in between, and it was from him I stole the power to cast myself across them, to do what I needed to do. I would be willing to believe my father was quite upset at him for allowing me to slip away. 
They would have been starving for thousands of years, and are weak, but have gained a little respite since they arrived. Them and their... spawn. The architect said, grimacing as she held up her hand again. The monstrous creatures that flickered into view reminded Emily of the things she had seen from other divers, while a very familiar slug-like creature made her skin crawl. Bastardized mockeries of life, likely the brainchild of my father and brother. Father's imagination is poor, and my brother needs more guidance than he. They have been gorging on my children since they arrived, and I am tired of weeping. The architect growled, turning her eyes to Emily. When my husband arrives, I believe I can convince him to join my side. We will kill the rest of my family that came through, or sever their connection and send them back to starve and die, just as it was to be in the beginning. When is that going to be exactly? Emily asked her, and she felt tired at just the thought of another adventure. Am I to venture forth again, once more into the breach? The architect smiled. We have time. Plenty of time. They will become frustrated when my children are no longer so easy to consume, and they will call for him to join us, to take me down and remove the thorn from their sides. Who is the Grim? Emily asked suddenly, turning in her seat to look at the architect. The architect chuckled again, turning in her seat as well. How mad would you be if I said I didn't know? How can you not know? Emily groaned out, leaning her head back. The architect grinned. What do I look like, one of the mothers? Emily looked back down at the architect in time to see the woman flick her heart on the nose, and she felt herself drop away from the dream as if someone had pulled the rug out from under her. Her stomach dropped painfully, and before she could scream, she jerked awake, sweating from head to toe in Merrill's bed. Emily sputtered, turning her head left and right, and while she was not covered in blood this time, she was soaked with sweat all the way down her pajamas. With a sniff, she was relieved to smell it was sweat, and only sweat, and Emily wiped her hand across her forehead. Fucking hell. They can do this shit in the daytime now. I gotta start demanding it. Meryl grumbled, turning in her sleep and looking up at Emily, bleary-eyed. Oh, demanding what? Emily looked down at Meryl, the centaurus' hair splayed out on her pillows in a halo. She smiled, then leaned down to plant a firm, sweaty kiss on Meryl's plush lips. Nothing. Just another visit from the Ark. Emily started, but leaned backwards with urgency when Meryl bolted upright. The architect? Oh god, my sheets! Meryl howled, whirling up on her equine knees and looking around at her bed, horrified. The horror gave way to relief, and Meryl held a hand to her humanoid stomach. Oh, thank fuck. Last time that happened, I found you in enough blood to satiate an Iron Maiden concert. Why the fuck are you all sweaty? And that's the end of Emily Braun's Chapter 8. Blood and flesh. Join the Discord, join the coffee. Donations always help because YouTube is paying us nothing as per usual. I'm streaming over on Twitch. Currently, we're doing the Quest Giver arc on World of Warcraft Hardcore. All that fun stuff. But until we see you next time on this side of the veil, that was Amanda, that was Danger, our senior female VA, that was Fire. And this is Guard Bros Field Desk.